Duchess, Washington, D.C. I am Tomas Salamante, Deputy Chief of Staff to Mayor Muriel Bowser and your host for this evening. Thank you for joining us for Mayor Bowser's FY23 Budget Engagement Forum. We are coming to you live, virtually, from the OCTFME studios, and we have a very exciting and interactive program planned for you. Tonight, you're going to get to hear from Mayor Bowser, City Administrator Kevin Donahue, Budget Director Jennifer Reed, and our Deputy Mayors. But most importantly, we will get to hear from you. Later on in the program, you will have the opportunity to speak directly with Mayor Bowser and share your budget priorities and questions with her as she prepares her budget proposal. To participate in, in our interactive program or in the Q&A session later in the program with Mayor Bowser, please head over now to budget.dc.gov. To participate in our interactive games, you have to click the Play Now button on budget.dc.gov or scan the QR code on your screen or right down here uh, below me on the ticker. Okay, DC, we're going to give you a second to get in there. Are you ready for our first question? We're going to start. What ward are you participating from? So results are going to start to come in. We're going to see where everyone's participating from. Again, budget.dc.gov. Click on the Play Now button to be entered into the game. You can also scan the QR code right below you, and you will be able to start answering our interactive survey questions. So again, we want to hear from you. Where are you participating from? And those results are starting to ticker in. So as they come in, I want to remind everyone again, budget.dc.gov and click the Play Now button or scan the QR code on your screen right below me. You can do that from any of the feeds or anywhere in the TV. And we're starting to see our results come in. Exciting. We're seeing representation in Ward 1, Ward 3, Ward 7, Ward 6, Ward 5. Really good running the gambit across the city. So again, we're just going to give you just a moment to get into our game. Uh, so again, that's budget.dc.gov and click the Play Now button. Looks like we're getting representation from all eight wards, which is very exciting. We are so excited to hear from you tonight on your project priorities all across the city. So keep, keep clicking in, sharing those results. Very exciting to see we have representation coming in from across the city. And again, one more reminder, if you would like to play at any time in our interactive games, you got to go to budget.dc.gov now. Budget.dc.gov, click the Play Now button, and you'll be able to start playing in our game or simply scan the QR code on your screen. And fantastic, we are seeing people representing all eight wards in tonight's game. I know a lot of you will be joining in here in, in a moment, so we're just so excited to have representation from across the city. We're gonna go to our next question, which is, is this your first budget engagement forum? You know, we've been holding these for eight years now, which I can't believe it's been eight years of budget engagement forums. And so whether you've participated in one or two before, or this is your first time, we're excited to have you. And we see these results coming in, and there's a lot of, it looks pretty neck and neck of first time or people that have participated in the past and looks just neck and neck, just a little bit over uh, on the results that this is your first, majority of our participants, this is our first budget engagement forum. So we wanna say thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and we're gonna close the results out now because it looks like we have over a majority of our participants, this is your first time. So we wanna say thank you so much for participating. For those of you that have participated in the past, again, I just said this is our eighth year of doing these forums. We wanna welcome you back. I think if you've participated every year, you get a, a gold star. So I have one last question for you before we start out the night, and that is what is your dot budget priority? So right now you can enter your top budget priority. We have a fun word cloud that's gonna to start to populate as you enter your top budget priority, and we will get to hear from you on what those results are. Is it public safety? Is it education? What is your top priority? Why did you come today to share your budget priorities with the mayor? I'm really seeing so many mix of, of those top issues. We're seeing education, public safety, housing, schools, uh, immigration. We're seeing transportation, equity, so many great results coming in. So really it runs the gambit of, of what our budget covers and tonight we'll get to hear from you directly. So great that word clouds keep falling. Keep thinking about those budget ideas, what your pri budget priorities are, because later on in the program, we will, we will be able to hear from you. And, and keep the screen open, because later on you'll be able to play the $100 game, our favorite, our fun $100 game on that screen and share how you will allocate your $100. But now we're gonna get started with tonight's forum. And to kick us off, please welcome our mayor, Mayor Muriel Bowser. Good evening, Washington, D.C., and thank you, Tomas, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to our annual budget engagement forum. And as Tomas has said, we've done this each year, and we use these forums to get feedback from D.C. residents before sending my final budget to the council. And I truly... It, I, it, 
really appreciate hearing from you directly. Uh, last week, for an example, more than 5,000 seniors joined the Senior Budget Engagement Forum, and we heard feedback on everything from how we can get more D.C. residents employed in D.C. government uh, to how we can engage more community-based organizations in our public safety efforts. One of the benefits of having a second term in office has been the ability to see big investments through that we made early on in my administration. In just the past few weeks, for example, we were able to open a new grocery store in Ward 8. We broke ground on a new Lidl in Skyland and announced that we're, we will use eminent domain to bring a second new grocery store to Ward 7. We added tech jobs at the MLK Gateway in historic Anacostia and announced that eight restaurants will open or expand in Ward 7 and 8. We also opened the new 801 East Men's Shelter at the St. Elizabeth's campus, which is going to transform the way we deliver services to men who need help getting back into permanent housing. And tomorrow, I will be back at St. Elizabeth's campus to make good on a promise and break ground on a new hospital. All of these projects have been years in the making, and I'm proud to have a team here at D.C. government that has been able to unstick long-stalled projects and move them forward to create housing, jobs, and opportunity for D.C. residents. But we've been able to do that because D.C. taxpayers have been willing to invest more into our community. And so as we celebrate our progress, the budget process is our opportunity to pause, consider our challenges, and invest in solutions that we believe will work for our city. Up front, I can tell you a few things to expect in the upcoming budget. First, we've already announced that we're growing our public education budget by about $200 million next school year. Our schools are our strongest connection to students and families, and this investment acknowledges that. You can also expect that we will continue to build on the significant investments we've made in housing. Over the past seven years, we've invested over a billion dollars into our city's housing production trust fund. But the pandemic also created some new housing challenges. To help alleviate those burdens, last year we got $352 million in federal emergency rental assistance out to more than 50,000 households. But we need to keep pushing. Too many Washingtonians worry about being priced out of our city. That means we need to drive down housing prices and we need to simultaneously help more Washingtonians grow their income and build wealth. Among many housing investments in the FY22 budget, that's the budget we're in right now, include $113 million to rehabilitate public housing, $18 million to help low-income first home, home buyers, and a nearly $12 million investment to help families who have experienced homelessness avoid the benefits cliff as they advance in their careers. But at the same time, we don't res want residents in the lowest income brackets to feel like they're just getting by day to day. We want people connected to opportunities that create pathways to the middle class. That's why we're building programs like our DC Infrastructure Academy, including over $42 million to dramatically expand subsidized employment and training through apprenticeship opportunities. It's why we've invested $29 million to reimagine high school, uh, an experience that we know will help more of our residents get connected uh, to jobs and public service, like the MPD Cadet Academy. It's also why when we talk about affordable housing and home buying programs, we also include workforce housing, because we don't want people in the middle class, especially people who are first generation middle class, to be rent burdened either. And finally, this year we will continue to throw every resource at the recent rise in violent crime. We need our Metropolitan Police Department to get back up to 4,000 officers. People want to see officers out in the community and we also need enough officers and detectives to quickly solve crimes when they happen. That is all part of having a functioning criminal justice ecosystem. In addition to investing in MPD, we will continue to make significant investments in a long-term public health approach to public safety. 
This is about targeting people most at risk of getting involved in violent activity or becoming a victim of violent activity and getting them connected to better opportunities. It's also about sending violence interrupters into community to intervene before situations escalate to the point of violence. We have had some extraordinarily heartbreaking incidents of violence and loss of life in our community. And so much of it is because people are using guns in the streets with no regard for human life. This is, of course, a problem that is so specific to our country and that we recognize will take national solutions. But we also know that we can't sit around and wait for the federal government to fix it. So we will continue to invest in programs and organizations that are working proactively to combat gun violence. And whenever we see a program working, we'll scale it up. So as we do each year, we have a lot to think about. You will hear from our deputy mayors about their priorities. You'll have opportunities throughout the evening to weigh in and share feedback. But first, you will hear uh, from my budget director, Jenny Reed, uh, who directs the Office of Budget and Performance Management, as well as the city administrator for the District of Columbia, Kevin Donahue. Thank you, Mayor Bowser, and hello, Washington, D.C. We are excited to connect with you and begin our fiscal year 23 budget conversations. Here in the district, we have a multi-step budget process involving lots of stakeholders, including you. And it all gets started in the late fall and winter when district government agencies prepare their budget requests for the coming year, and the mayor's budget team that I lead begins reviewing the details. Next, a crucial step in the process is talking to you, the residents who use the programs, the services, and the facilities that we fund through the budget. Budget engagement forums help us hear more about what you want to see as the most important funding priorities. We then take that information, get final agency input, and present the mayor's budget to the DC Council this year on March 16th. The council then spends about two months reviewing the mayor's budget, hearing from the community, making some changes, and approving the budget to be sent to Congress for review. After that, we move into the execution phase of the budget, which really means just spending the funds on the programs and services that were funded. That's not the last step, though. Here in the district, Mayor Bowser has set high standards for accountability so that you know exactly how we're spending funds and what you're getting for your money. Through the Mayor's Accountability Report, as well as the Council's Agency Performance Oversight Hearings and our annual audit, we're able to clearly understand and tell you what programs are working and which aren't before we start planning for next year. Now, let me give you a quick Budget 101. Our operating budget for fiscal year 22 is $18.4 billion. This was the largest budget in our city's history. The largest share of the budget, $5.4 billion, is spent on health and human services, and it supports programs like healthcare for thousands of residents, assistance for our seniors, and housing for our unhoused neighbors. The second largest share of the budget is called enterprise financing at $4.8 billion. This is money used to pay for things like retiree costs, collective bargaining agreement increases, and debt service. Next is education at $3.5 billion. This supports our public school students, our libraries, our recreation centers, the great University of the District of Columbia, and job training programs, just to name a few. The fourth largest share of the budget at $2.3 billion is public works and government operations. This pays for items like picking up your trash and recycling, making sure your car can get inspected, and the people who pave streets, alleys, repair sidewalks, and install bike lanes. After that, we invest $1.6 billion for public safety. This pays for firefighters, ambulances, police officers, and 911 operators, as well as our violence interruption programs. It pays for victim services, and life-changing programs for residents who are most at risk of gun violence. Finally, we spend $800 million of our budget on economic development. This supports our affordable housing initiatives, assistance to our small businesses, and planning efforts for our city. I will now turn it over to City Administrator Kevin Donahue to talk about how we allocated our fiscal year 22 budget. Thank you, Jenny. Hello, everyone. I'm Kevin Donahue, and I have the privilege of serving as Mayor Bowser's city administrator. You just heard our budget director talk about the overall budget process. Now, I will dive into some of the details of the numbers. 
A budget is a reflection of our values and it can make a huge impact on our residents' lives. I'll highlight a few of these investments. In education, our budget made historic investments in our students and our buildings. We put over $1.6 billion, .1 billion on modernizing and expanding our public schools. We also put over $400 million to improve our parks, playgrounds, rec centers, and libraries. In housing, keeping our city affordable is our top priority. We invested $400 million in the Housing Production Trust Fund and provided $40 million in housing vouchers for our low-income residents. We also know public safety is of utmost importance. That's why we made historic investment in the largest investment in violence prevention efforts in our city's history, including nearly 10 million for violence interrupters and nearly 12 million to provide returning citizens with cash assistance. In economic development, our budget invested 43 million to expand job training programs for residents and provided 58 million to provide access to grocery stores and restaurants in Ward 7 and 8. In Health and Human Services, we're incredibly excited about the opening of a new hospital at St. Elizabeth's in Ward 8 and have invested $320 million to make this happen. We also put $4 million to expand telehealth services, which has been critical throughout the pandemic. Now, we know that the environment and transportation is also of the utmost importance. That's why we put $350 million in our city's roadways to make them safer and $71 million to support healthier homes and schools. We know that COVID-19 has had a huge impact on our lives, so the budget also provides financial support for this recovery, including millions for rental assistance for our residents to prevent evictions, over $5 million to expand job opportunities in H and summer youth employment program, and millions to provide assistance to arts and cultural institutions and provide laptops to our students, seniors, and residents. Now, I just went over just a few of the investments that we made in our budget. And I'm going to turn it over to Tomas to listen to your ideas for how we should build the FY23 budget. Thank you so much, City Administrator Donahue and Director Reed, for that very informative overview of the budget and, and past investments in, our, in the mayor's budget proposals. Uh, so in a moment, you will hear from our deputy mayors as well. And we're going to bring back the fan favorite game, our $100 game, in just a moment. Make sure you go to budget.dc.gov now and click the Play Now button uh, so you can start uh, get ready to play the game with us. Um, we are also honored to share that we have been joined in studio tonight by some of our COVID heroes. They are DC educators and healthcare workers who have been working tirelessly throughout the pandemic. Tonight, they will be playing the $100 game in real time, just like if we were all together. With them is Julia Irving, the director of the Mayor's Office of Community Relations and Services. Julia, how's it going in there? Ni hao, Tomas. It may be cold outside, but things sure are heating up in here. Our COVID heroes have taken off their capes and they've put pen to paper to figure out how we're going to balance this budget. But we're going to take a pause and check in with a couple of our heroes. Hello everyone, my name is Ashley. It is really getting intense in here. It is proving far more difficult to try to allocate these funds. Director Reed, they definitely are appreciating the work of you and your team at this time. But we're going to check in with another COVID hero. Good evening. This is Dominique Foster here. And let me just say, all of the educators in the room are standing firm on where we, we believe a large chunk of these funds yes. should be allocated. It is quite a heated debate in here, but pretty soon we will have figures in here. But we're going to get back to that pen on the paper to figure out how we can balance this budget, and hopefully it'll align with what our neighbors at home have. Back to you, Tomas. So much, Julia, and thank you to our COVID heroes. I think Deputy Mayor Kine loved what you just heard in there. Uh, but we're excited for me to hear from you and, and shortly in studio about how you allocated those hundred dollars. And in just a few moments, you at home will be able to start allocating your dollars a hundred dollar game as well. So again, make sure you go to budget.dc.gov now to play or scan the QR code. You will also have the opportunity in a moment to start asking your questions of Mayor Bowser during our live Q&A portion. If you would like to ask the mayor a question, please head over again to budget.dc.gov, or if you're already there, click on the Ask the Mayor button to be added into our queue. When we call on you to ask your question, we just make sure you lower your stream so that we're able to hear you and don't get interference, because we want to make sure that the mayor can hear you clearly on your budget priorities. Now, before we get to the game, our deputy mayors traveled across the district to share a little bit more about their clusters and why you should allocate the biggest portion of your budget to them during the $100 game. We're going to kick off our pitches with the Assistant and City Administrator, Lindsay Parker, and Deputy Mayor for Education, Paul Kine. Take it away. 
Hi, I'm Lindsay Parker, and I'm proud to serve in the Bowser administration as the Assistant City Administrator, heading up DC government's internal services agencies, responsible for people, facilities, contracts, and technology. Think about us like you think about your home budget, your homeowner's insurance, your Wi-Fi, your security alarm system, your rent, your mortgage, your car note, even your cleaning supplies. How about the contractors and the people who help you keep your home safe and livable? You invest in those things, and I get it, not always because you want to, but you know that you have to. Well, that's the same for our government. The internal services team is the backbone that helps our public-facing agencies operate. In fact, today, I'm standing in one of our many warehouses where millions in supplies and equipment have passed through on the way to you, your neighbors, healthcare centers, first responders, schools, and more, managed by our COVID logistics team. Kind of like you've done at home over the past few years, we've all had to change the ways we meet our needs. The pandemic has changed our supply chains, your expectations of government. Mayor Bowser has charged us to focus on making sure that we are continuing to find new and easier ways to get things done around government so that your service is provided faster, where you want it and when you need it. An investment in internal services not only keeps the lights on, but allows us to innovate to help deliver the government that you expect in this new and better normal. Good evening, everyone. I'm Paul Kine, the district's deputy mayor for education here at Ballou High School. I am incredibly proud to lead the mayor's education and workforce cluster. We work hard every day to make a great city for children to grow up in, a city where they can learn, have fun, and go on to amazing opportunities. I know that as you spend dollars in today's $100 game, perhaps surrounded by children of your own, you'll remember that public education and good jobs are the heartbeat of our city's future. Of course, our future begins with our littlest residents. Families in all eight wards must have access to high quality and affordable childcare. That's why the mayor has invested to not only keep the 27,000 licensed childcare seats across our city, like at Bright Beginnings here in Ward 8, but also to make space for 1,000 more infants and toddlers. We are also giving new supports to our fabulous childcare educators by paying for college scholarships and for retention bonuses. After childcare, our kids deserve to go to strong public schools. Before the pandemic, DC was the fastest improving system in the country, and we aim to keep it that way, by doubling down on investments in learning, but also providing the kinds of social and emotional supports that have become even more essential. These big challenges must be met with big actions and big investments. That's why Mayor Bowser just announced a historic 10% increase to the city's public education budget, including a $36 million recovery fund so that every single public school gets what it needs to face the pandemic head on. And it's why the mayor pushed so hard to get schools fully open, like here at Baloo, and why we're investing in so many new learning opportunities, including high impact tutoring, school year internships, DPR boost camps, and of course, the Summer Youth Employment Program. It's also why we continue to invest in youth safety, including the new Safe Passage, Safe Blocks program to place more than 200 trusted adults on routes our children use to get to and from school. And as young people make their way through secondary school and beyond, we are reimagining the high school experience, connecting DC students to work-based learning experiences in, for example, cybersecurity, and healthcare. We also recently launched DC Futures, a program to break down traditional barriers to college and provide scholarship supports needed for residents to earn degrees in high demand fields. We're investing in career coaches to help residents find a great job and co-designing programs with employers that prepare our residents for the future of work. Now, none of this would be possible without our extraordinary teachers educators, support staff, school leaders, and workforce trainers. We honor them and thank them. So, as you consider these pitches and spend your dollars, remember that we are investing in our teachers and trainers and building a road to recovery for our city, which starts with our children and our youth. 
Thank you so much, Deputy Mayor Kine and, and Assistant City Administrator Parker. Thank you all. Our deputy mayors have now joined us in studio. So uh, Assistant City Administrator Parker, usually in the game, government operations or internal services gets the smallest piece of the pie. So what do you want to tell to our residents at home playing why they should give you a little bit more this year? Well, thanks so much, Tomas. I really appreciate getting to go first. Um, <laughs> what I'm hoping, though, uh, is that you're going to hear some really exciting projects from my colleagues sitting next to me, uh, but know one thing. Uh, we can make them all happen uh, faster, simpler, fairer if you invest in government operations. So give them $5, but then give us one. Uh, so every $5 you spend on them, think about government operations because we're going to make it work. Thanks so much. I love that. Very strategic. We're, I know our, our uh, other deputy mayors are eager for their pitches, so we're going to go next to Deputy Mayor for Health and Human Services, Wayne Turnage, and Deputy Mayor for Public Safety and Justice, Chris Gelthart. Good evening, everyone. My name is Wayne Turnage, and I have the distinct pleasure to serve as both the Deputy Mayor for Health and Human Services and the, and the Director of the Department of Healthcare Finance. Tonight, I want to share with you the efforts of our cluster to address long-standing issues confronting district residents while stressing the importance of continued investments in their health and well-being. The health of our residents incorporates issues of housing, food quality and access, education, and transportation. These factors are highly correlated with resident health status and thus must be considered as a part of any broad scale plan to improve the well-being of residents across the city. The normal challenges faced by Mayor Muriel Bowser as she worked to formulate her fiscal year 2023 budget proposal were significantly aggravated by, by the pernicious power of the pandemic. The impact of COVID-19 on residents' health, employment, and life circumstances required the mayor to adopt a whole of government approach to mitigate the damaging effects of the virus on the health and welfare of district residents. In response, Mayor Bowser made sweeping investments in a number of human service programs, including funding to support family housing and restabilization efforts through short and medium term rental subsidies and customized supportive services for eligible persons whose housing situations had suddenly destabilized. Allocations to reflect the growing need for resident cash assistance, a need reflected in rising public assistance caseloads and aggravated by surging inflationary pressures emergency assistance to prevent large-scale evictions of persons whose rental accounts are in arrears, significant investments in a newly designed service-intense shelter system for single adults who are looking to transition into more stable and permanent housing, funding for housing vouchers that can be used by single adults and families to move from tented encampments on the streets and, and congregate shelters and into their own apartments, investments to help residents address persistent substance abuse issues and advance mental health treatment. This includes creating a new sobering center to divert low-risk patients from crowded emergency rooms, as well as expanded telehealth services for behavioral health and disability services clients. And finally, funding to hire more school nurses and increase the pay of those already on staff to ensure that children have access to critical nursing services as the city recovers from the pandemic. These are critically important investments, but I would be remiss if I did not mention the significant allocations the mayor is making to improve healthcare east of the river. Construction is just about to begin for the district's new state-of-the-art hospital at the St. Elizabeth's East Campus. The, the impressive facility will be the centerpiece of an advanced and integrated healthcare system for Ward 7 and 8. This month, we will break ground and reveal the name of the new hospital, which is slated to open in late 2024. So why such attention to Ward 7 and 8? As most of you know, these two wards have unique characteristics and unfortunately, persistent challenges not witnessed in other areas of the city. 40% of the residents in these two areas rely upon the district's Medicaid program for health insurance. Disproportionately, these areas are inhabited by the youngest residents in the city, many of whom live with the daily challenges of poverty. And despite having comprehensive health insurance coverage, residents in wards seven and eight have higher morbidity levels than observed in any other part of the district. And tragically, as a result of these issues, 
A child born in wards seven and eight today can expect to live on average 15 years less than children born on the same day in any other part of the city. This investment is the first major step in changing this outcome. The challenges created by the pandemic in the district dramatically increased our residents' need for support in significant and multiple areas of their lives. The mayor's proposed budget directly addresses many of these challenges. At the same time, the mayor's continued investment in the integrated health care systems for Ward 7 and 8 speak directly to the long-standing health care problems that are concentrated among residents who live east of the river. I hope all of you, regardless of where you live, will stop and examine your conscience as you consider this budget proposal, recognizing that every D.C. resident, regardless of station or stature, deserves a fair shot. Thank you for your time. Hello, D.C. I'm Chris Geldart, your Deputy Mayor for Public Safety and Justice. I'm here today at the Edgewood Recreation Center to talk to you about our public safety and justice ecosystem and your investment in it. As a Deputy Mayor of Public Safety and Justice, it's my responsibility to help Mayor Bowser ensure the safety and well-being of all of our residents. We all want to feel and be safe, so I am asking for $25 or a quarter of your $100 budget to sustain our public safety and justice efforts. Our mayor knows that public safety is an ecosystem with a balance of good crime prevention strategies, like our Building Blocks Initiative, strong intervention and enforcement, which means a fully funded and resourced police department, and accountability with real rehabilitation, not just incarceration. Through the mayor's $59 million investment this year in the Building Blocks Initiative, we've been able to expand our gun violence reduction and interruption efforts through increased violence interrupters doing the outreach work needed to impact change. And community-based grants providing the resources to bring the intense collaborative work of housing, human services, behavioral health, and employment services to the areas we know need it most. While we know that public health tools are incredibly important to preventing crime, we also know a good system has the capacity to apply law enforcement to also prevent crime and arrest those that commit crime when it occurs. We're moving in the right direction with the $11 million investment in funding for resources last fiscal year for our police, and we need to keep that momentum. Currently, we have a police department of about 3,500 officers, and we know from historical experience that we need to be right about 4,000 officers to get to where we need to be. We're doing this by expanding our cadet program and intensifying our recruiting efforts, putting our resources to yielding results. We know we have a lot of work to do. We all agree that our residents who are incarcerated deserve dignified and humane surroundings. And we pledge to ensure that we can attest to this truth every day. We also have one of the best rehabilitative programs through our work with a partnership at Georgetown University and with others, providing the education and life skill courses our residents need to re-enter the community. That includes our young people who find themselves in situations where they made poor decisions. We're scaling our youth services to provide support for young people before they become committed at the Department of Youth and Rehabilitative Services. Because we know we provide the interventions needed to divert young people from becoming ultimately immersed in the justice system. So one part of the system can't function successfully without the others. They only function as well as the whole, and we are laser focused on scaling what's working and improving anything that is not. Thank you for trusting Mayor Bowser and myself and other leaders to make our city safer and for investing your priceless resources in improving your public safety ecosystem. Your $25 investment will be used to sustain and expand these efforts, and you will not be disappointed. Thank you so much, Deputy Mayor Geldhart and uh, Deputy Mayor Turnage. Two things, Deputy Mayor Turnage. One, we are breaking ground tomorrow on the new hospital for St. Elizabeth's, which is very exciting. Uh, and, and two, you looked quite cool in those shades, I got to say. But what do you want to say to our residents as they are allocating their funds? What, what do you want to say to them as to make sure that you get the biggest piece of the pie? Uh, thank you so much. 
I will say this to the residents of the District of Columbia. When the mayor was first elected, uh, one of the uh, foundational pillars of her budget was every resident of D.C. deserves a fair shot. If you do not uh, allocate resources to protect the health uh, and well-being of our residents, uh, they will not have a fair shot. Uh, despite what many will tell you, we don't all start at the same level, and we have a significant minority of our residents uh, that need a hand up. And the allocations that are made to the Health and Human Services budget, whether it be for this beautiful new hospital that the mayor will uh, uh, break ground on tomorrow, whether it be to help persons whose uh, rents have fallen in arrears because of troubles, whether it be to provide the necessary cash assistance for people to be able to meet the daily needs of their life, you have to basically uh, provide the kind of resources that are necessary to help residents get a fair shot. So I would urge all of you to give Health and Human Resources uh, a hard look when you allocate uh, portions of your $100. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deputy Mayor. And last but certainly not least, we have two more pitches for you. Uh, Deputy Mayor for Operations and Infrastructure, Lucinda Babers, and Deputy Mayor for Planning and Economic Development, John Felchicchio. Take it away. Hey, y'all. I'm Lucinda Babers, Deputy Mayor for Operations and Infrastructure. My seven cluster agencies make sure residents and businesses have basic services, such as transportation, environmental and consumer protections, licenses and vehicle registrations, insurance and financial empowerment, building and business services, trash and recycling collections, whew, and more. That's a big responsibility. And that's why I'm asking you to give $25 out of your $100 to our cluster, Demois. Trust me, we'll put it to use, good use. Not like those other clusters, because thanks to Mayor Bowser's leadership, we have some big plans in three key areas. Let me tell you about them. First, transportation. The district is receiving millions to invest from the Federal American Rescue Plan Act of 2021. But while those funds help support our local funding efforts, they don't replace them. That's why I need you to set aside $10 so that we can do more to help you travel safely to work, home, and play, such as this beautiful bridge that I'm standing in front of. By installing bus priority lanes, building more walking trails, and expanding bike lanes, we can get it done. We also need that money to make more Vision Zero safety improvements to eliminate traffic-related fatalities and injuries, such as speed humps, crosswalks, and other traffic calming measures. Next is the environment. The climate is changing. We've already had the warmest December on record and are seeing more events like flooding in our communities. To mitigate such events and advance Mayor Bowser's sustainable DC plan, we need $10 from you. This money will help our efforts to build out citywide projects like green infrastructure. It will also help you at home by providing you with resources for home weatherization to improve energy efficiency lead and mold hazard mitigation, and solar panel installations. And it will enable you to reimagine how you can travel in the city in an environmentally friendly way by adding more charging stations for electric vehicles and allowing you to take more rides in carbon-friendly electric buses. Finally, building upon our service delivery. The pandemic affected our daily operations, but we've learned a lot to include providing more services online and using more technology. As we look forward to recovering from the pandemic, we need $5 to help build upon our services, such as digitizing driver licensings, providing more equipment and staffing to the Department of Public Works, and making sure our Department of Consumer and Regulatory Affairs provides seamless building and licensing permits. As you can see, your $25 will be well spent in the Demois cluster. Thank you in advance for helping us serve you better. Bye now. Hi everyone, I'm John Falcicchio, Deputy Mayor for Planning and Economic Development. At the start of her second term, Mayor Bowser sent a bold goal of delivering 36,000 units of housing for district residents, including at least 12,000 units of affordable housing by 2025. 
By further equitably distributing these goals by neighborhood, Mayor Bowser has made DC the very first jurisdiction in the nation to create affordable housing goals by neighborhood. From January 2019 to February 2021, the district has produced 20,603 net new units, of which 3,590 are affordable. Mayor Bowser's historic $400 million investment in the Housing Production Trust Fund in physical years 21 and 22 has brought the mayor's total investment in the Housing Production Trust Fund since 2015 to $1 billion. And we're thinking creatively about how we deliver more affordable housing and the future of affordable housing in DC. In fact, at the mayor's request, we released the Housing in Downtown Request for Information to identify opportunities for converting existing commercial office space into additional housing in downtown DC. The mayor knows that a vibrant DC means more resources to invest in people, programs, and neighborhoods across all of DC. Exploring ways to bring more residents downtown is a step to reimagining Washington, D.C. and restoring its vibrancy for our residents, visitors, and local businesses. A win-win-win all around. In addition to creating more housing, Mayor Bowser has also tasked us with addressing inequitable access to fresh, healthy, and affordable food. So in line with that, our work is focused on securing grocery stores or other brick-and-mortar new food markets within one mile of all residents of the district, especially those east of the river in wards seven and eight. One of the tools that we've used for this purpose is the Food Access Fund, a grant program that helps us increase equitable access to fresh, healthy, and affordable food by incentivizing grocery stores and other food-related businesses to expand to areas with low food access. In the first round of funding, DEMPED has awarded approximately $9 million to eight recipients to create food access points in these wards. And it's helped us clear the way for a start to the long stalled project at Capital Gateway Marketplace, where a grocery store has been promised for over 20 years. Looking ahead, we're requesting additional funds in FY23 for successful program to continue to bring food options to residents and neighborhoods that need them. Finally, we know that Washington DC is a resilient city that pivots and grows in the face of challenges. They don't call us additional comebacks for nothing, right? So we will continue to be the best city in the world to do business, to bring big ideas to life and set the standard of inclusive prosperity for all. So when you think about how you'll spend your $100, know that investing in economic development means investing in more affordable housing, greater food security and stronger local businesses. Thank you so much, Deputy Mayor Babers and Deputy Mayor Falchicchio. Deputy Mayor Falchicchio, you know, speak now. How are you going to ensure you get the biggest piece of pie with our residents? Well, Deputy Mayor Babers sent those buses to try to distract me during my pitch. <laughs> but I'll say that uh, everybody tonight, if you're watching from home, uh, just think how important that is to you, how important that is to the stability of your family, uh, and making sure that everybody has a pathway to the middle class. So tonight, really, I want you to think about uh, where you are right now, housing and how important that is, and make an investment in it. But Tomas, I think the reason this game is so hard is because at the end of the day, that $100 uh, has to balance out. So great pitches by all the deputy yeah. mayors, uh, but really the hard part now is on you where you've got to balance that with a $100 of investment. Uh, so Tomas, we know this is the hardest part, turning it back to our residents. Thank you so much. And again, exactly. Now is the moment we've all been waiting for. It's time for the $100 game. If you have your survey window up already, the screen will start prompting you to allocate your $100. You don't have that screen up yet? Go to budget.dc.gov now on your computer or your phone and click the Play Now button. You can also scan the QR code right below me on the screen, and it'll take you right to the game so that you can participate. And we also have it big for you on the screen right now. So scan that code to start allocating your $100. In a moment, we will also begin our Q&A session with Mayor Bowser. On that same screen, budget.dc.gov, you can click the Ask the Mayor button on the page. We advise you to lower your stream so that we can hear you when we patch you in to ask your question of the mayor, because we want to hear you nice and clear. But as we await your responses on the $100 game, we're going to hear from our in-studio COVID heroes about how they allocated their $100. And we heard how it was heating up in there. So Julia, let us know how it went. 
Well, Tomas, it got pretty intense in there. I definitely understand why these are our COVID heroes because they work well under pressure. It was definitely a heated discussion around should we really fund gov ops? Yeah, I think we should fund gov ops. But eventually, our COVID healthcare hero, Dion, used her skills working in pre-op at GW to help navigate us and reallocate and balance our budget. Dion? Thank you. My team would allocate $100 as follows. Health and Human Services, $25. Public Safety and Justice, $20. Transportation and Environment, $10. Housing and Economic Development, $15. Education, $25. And Government Operations, $5. Thank you. ACA Parker, do not be discouraged by that, because I'm going to walk over to our COVID hero that advocated the strongest for you in there. Hi, I'm Tiffany. Um, allocating the $100 was one of the most difficult things we thought we would be doing today, uh, but we did decide to spend 50% of our budget after spending two years in a pandemic with our health care services and our education department. And Deputy Mayor Turnage, I think you put a ringer in there because when I told somebody that you liked Ohio State, they immediately upped the money in Health and Human Services. <laughs> OH. Uh, uh, so as a group, we all agreed that it was just really enjoyable just to connect and collaborate with other uh, education and healthcare leaders locally. Uh, and we're just happy to be a part of the conversation, especially something as serious as the budget when it comes to investing throughout the district. So we balance the budget. We hope that it reflects what our neighbors at home came up with. Back to you, Tomas. Thank you so much, Julia. Well, what do you think so far, Mayor? That sounds pretty I mean, tough. It is tough, but I, I love the reasoning. I love the conversation that we're having. I'm trying to think back to years past um, about how some of these dollars add up. And I think it is adding up a little differently um, than the the categories that we've we've seen in years past. And as we as we just heard, your reasoning for making human services and education the larger the larger items um, of your budget. So we'll see how that plays out in the questions. Thank you for your hard work, but more more importantly, thank you for your service over these last couple of years. We appreciate you. And don't go anywhere yet mm -hmm. to our, our in-studio COVID heroes. We're going to hear from a few of you a little bit later. But as you all heard at home, that was not an easy task. And now we will get to hear from you uh, as how you allocated your $100. Uh, so again, if you have a question or a comment for the mayor uh, regarding the FY23 budget, head over to budget.dc.gov now. Click the Ask the Mayor button to be entered into our queue. Again, we do ask if you're watching the stream to just lower that a little bit so we can hear you and hear you. Uh, Mayor, we are going to now get to the Q&A portion okay. to hear how our residents allocated. Our first, our first question is going to come uh, from a pre-submitted question from one of our residents, so we're going to go to that question first. Hi, my name is Yusafi, and I'm a small business owner in Ward 3. I would like to ask the Mayor, what's the plan to support business owner recovering from COVID pandemic? Well, I so appreciate that question. Uh, and we have spent the last two years focused on crushing this virus and getting back to normal. And that means getting people back to work, getting your customers um, back in your business, our corridors um, back to life. Uh, and in the process, uh, we have uh, issued a lot of relief funds um, to make sure that people can hang on uh, while we uh, get back to normal to be certain that you can keep your employees uh, employed and have their health care benefits, uh, and to make sure that we were supporting the employees that couldn't uh, stay on at their jobs. So how we come back uh, is, is critical. Uh, you're calling from Ward 3, so a lot of our neighborhood corridors uh, have been hit hard, but our downtown has also uh, been hit hard. So I have charged our team uh, with looking at all of our corridors to do what we can 
can do as the government to bring them to life, uh, whether that's through streeteries, um, through public events, uh, and certainly um, through making sure that they are they, that they are clean and safe, uh, and working with all of our employer partners. Uh, to while we know that people will spend some time working virtually, uh, we also want them to spend more time working in person to support our small and local businesses. So Deputy Mayor Falchicchio and the Department of Small and Local Businesses uh, will continue to make sure we have emergency relief funds uh, and we will continue a plethora of programs and services, whether you're a brick and mortar retail operation or whether you're operating uh, a, a business, a consulting business, an IT business uh, to, to keep DC residents employed and working. Thank you so much, Mayor. We're actually gonna go next to one of our COVID heroes uh, to ask uh, our next budget question. So go ahead, Julia. Mayor Bowser, we have a question from Principal Reed of Barnard Elementary School. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Bowser. Good to see you, Principal Reed. Thank you. There has been a significant exodus of educators from our classrooms. Many have resigned changed professions or simply quit. Numerous vacancies still exist in our schools for this current school year. What are your plans to retain dedicated educators who are committed for the long haul and to recruit well-trained educators so that DCPS can continue to be the fastest improving school district in the nation? Well, thank you for that question, Principal, and thank you for your hard work um, with our beautiful scholars at Barnard. Uh, we see what you're doing there as an example for our entire system. And one of the first things that we wanted to do was send a strong signal uh, to our educators that not only are we investing in our schools, uh, we're increasing that investment by by 10%. We wanted to send them the strong signal that inflation uh, would not eat away at your buying power as a principal. Uh, we recognize too that our teachers and our, our leaders in schools have been asked to do a lot of things uh, on top of education. So we want uh, to make sure that all of the other social and emotional and behavioral health services that you need are going to be in place. So. Uh, we've already announced this, um, that we're going to make sure that our schools are kept whole, uh, and that includes uh, looking at equity investments that we haven't been able to do um, before. So this is a budget um, that we can be proud of, uh, and we're going to present that to the council uh, and make sure that you and, and we uh, continue to say how important it is um, that this investment continues. And here's why. And, and trust me, um, when we make these investments, I kick the tires. I ask tough questions. I make sure that the dollars we're using are going to have an impact. Uh, and what we're going to do over the next several years with the, the proposal that I'm sending to the council is make up for that learning loss. Make up for that disconnection uh, between our students and um, trusted adults, teachers and social workers and after school providers that they haven't had that connection with um, for two years. And it's gonna, take, uh, it's gonna take a lot of work, but we are definitely in it. We wanna send this message and everybody knows this. I'm proud um, to be able to say wherever I go um, that we hi highly value our teachers and we pay them accordingly. Uh, and that uh, will be our, our continued message. I also know from teachers um, that they're not in it for the money. Uh, and this has been a tough couple of years for them, uh, for them personally, for their school uh, life, and everything else that all of us have been impacted by COVID by. Our teachers have experienced um, a double time. Um, so we are gonna continue to listen to them uh, and to respect their voices in the process of how we bring uh, our students back. Thank you so much, Mayor. And we're gonna patch into our first uh, question from an at-home participant. Sal from Ward 3, we're bringing you on now. Go ahead, Sal, with your question. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, I'm a retired dentist in DC and um, currently a member of the DC Coalition for Long-Term Care uh, and a subcommittee of that, which is in addressing the problem 
of our desperate need for an increase in healthcare workers. Now, right now, the ratio of needing people needing healthcare uh, at home or uh, at institutions such as provided by certified nursing assistants is about three to one, and it's getting worse and needs to be addressed. Uh, the primary problem is is the wage rate. Right now, um, these are very difficult jobs. They're difficult physically and also di difficult emotionally. And you're competing with people who are uh, out in the workplace, working in retail, et cetera, and with for similar wages or sometimes lower wages. So uh, what we're asking to do is to establish a minimum rate of $22 an hour. And uh, this way, um, it's, it's a rate that can calculate and increase the reimbursement rate for providers of long-term services and support can do that. And also, one of the things we're asking for is to reduce uh, the age at which uh, residents can train to become direct care staff. Right now, the age is 18, and we're asking for it to be lowered to 17, so students who are in high school uh, can get uh, a step up in getting involved in that. Um, this is a real problem, and it's going to be getting worse. As you know, our population is aging, as I am aware of myself, <laughs> and uh, something we need to address. And the sooner we get on it, the better it will be. Well, thank you, Sal, for, for that question. And as I recall, the last time we were doing our budget engagement in person, uh, we also discussed this issue. And uh, I certainly agree that we want to attract more and more DC residents to the very important work of providing care. Uh, and that's care along um, the spectrum from child care, which we've done a lot of work in, uh, to supporting uh, our residents with, with disabilities. Uh, and to also supporting our seniors. So I think there's a lot of work that we can do around care. You, however, I think are asking about um, specific, uh, specific initiative. And I think uh, Direct, uh, Deputy Mayor Turnage um, has done some work on this, and I'd like to turn to you, Wayne, to talk about it. Sure, thanks, Mayor. The first thing I would say is that we, at the Department of Healthcare Finance, which funds uh, uh, services provided uh, in, in the home for uh, persons who are eligible for the Medicaid program. We encourage all of the home care agencies to pay the wage that they need to pay to keep their workers. Once they do that, we capture those costs in expense reports and then we can adjust the rates that we pay them if in fact uh, their expenses are beyond the uh, previous uh, reimbursement. Now we understand that some uh, home care agencies are basically saying they don't have the uh, capital to front the wages uh, that uh, they believe are higher than their uh, uh, previous expenses. So what we're doing right now is I'm working with my finance team. We're developing uh, an analysis of the uh, uh, expense levels for the home care workers, and then we are trying to model what the impact of a wage increase would be both on the district's local fund and our federal costs. Uh, we have to be very cognizant of any change that we make in wage rates because it has to be, uh, it has to flow through the entire six-year financial plan for the District of Columbia. So we are working on a proposal. We will get that proposal to our budget director and our city administrator, and that proposal will eventually flow to the mayor. Thanks, Wayne. We'll go to our next question, Mayor. So we're going to go to an in-studio uh, question next, but I do want to remind everyone, if you're watching at home and you're on budget.dc.gov, click the Ask the Mayor button, and you'll be entered into the queue to be able to ask your question. If you're not there yet, go there now, and we'll get be able to get some more uh, at-home questions. Uh, Julia, take us to our next in-studio question. Indeed, Tomas. Now, this next COVID hero, they definitely advocated for education, but I think it might have had something to do with maybe him being the teacher of the year for 2021. Hi, good evening, thank you. My name is Alejandro Diaz Granados. I teach in Ward 7 at Aton Elementary in the culturally wealthy community of Deanwood, Lincoln Heights. Um, although our families love our community, it's been challenging for them to find access to high quality healthy food sources. Are there any plans to increase healthy food sources for families that are east of the river? 
Well, thank you and congratulations and thank you for your service as well. And we talked a little bit about, you heard in Deputy Mayor Falchicchio's introduction, the huge investment we were able to make last year in a fund that would help us attract um, healthy food providers in Ward 7 and 8. I've said frequently um, that you can go to parts of our city and if you throw a rock, you'll hit, you know, five different grocery stores. Um, but that's not the case in Ward 8, uh, and that's not the case in Ward 7. So uh, we have been particularly um, focused on using the district's buying power, whether it's putting a government lease uh, in Benning Heights to help attract more grocery, or using grants um, like we're doing at Skyland uh, to attract um, very successful businesses in other parts of the city to open a second location uh, in Ward 7, um, or like we did with the Good Foods Market that has been successfully operating in Ward 5 and now operating in Ward 8. Uh, we have a very, very um, big focus in Ward 7 as well, like Capital Gateway, as John uh, said, that uh, the community has been promised a grocery store for 20 years, and we're getting real close um, to delivering one. All right, Mayor, we're ready for our next question. An at-home question from Giselle in Ward 2. Giselle, you'll be able to ask your question now. Hi, thank you, Mayor Bowser. Um, I am actually in Ward 6. I am a small business owner, and I wanted to talk about two big issues, crime and homelessness. I want to thank you for the commitment to public safety in the budget, but I want to highlight that there really need to be more funds to bring more police onto the streets in DC, uh, less funds to returning convicted felons, and less funds to well-intentioned, but unfortunately unproven violence reduction nonprofits. Um, I also, in terms of policy, uh, the Biden administration's Department of Justice uh, very succinctly rejected a proposal to overhaul the DC criminal code. That overhaul includes doing things like getting rid of accomplice murder in DC. And I just want to urge you uh, to work with the DC City Council to try to get a proposal for uh, reworking our criminal code that uh, promotes public safety and doesn't undermine it as uh, the Justice Department uh, indicated. And then finally, homelessness. Um, here in Ward 6, we have several homeless shelters. And unfortunately, uh, we have seen drug dealers and other individuals prey on the homeless shelter population. We've also seen throughout DC so many homeless people that are in mental health crises. Um, for example, I walked with my church through McPherson Square several days ago. Um, almost everyone that we encountered was facing a mental health crisis, and it's clear that they are not receiving the, res the residential treatment that they need. Um, in light of the unfortunate and, and completely traumatic murder and tragic murder of Christina Lee in New York City, I want to make sure that there is appropriate funding to address the urgent mental health needs for the homeless population. Well, thank you. Um, that was a it was a big question, and you addressed a lot of issues. Um, we are setting, and when I became mayor, we laid out a course. Uh, Kevin was the deputy mayor for public safety at that time uh, to deal with the retirement bubble that MPD was then facing to get to 4,000 officers. We put a lot of programs and incentives in place to do exactly that, and we were on track to do that. Um, and a couple of years ago, we've got a little bit off track because of funding decreases. Um, so what I have directed my team to do is to work on a multi-year strategy to get us to 4,000 officers. And that, I think that's where we need uh, to be. Uh, having said that, uh, we also know that there is a public safety ecosystem that is just not the police. Uh, we need the police that we need, but we also need to get to the relatively small number of people that are causing most of the violence. Uh, and that's what our Building Blocks initiative is laid, uh, is designed to do over the course of time. Identify the people who we know um, because they have used guns 
guns in our city, um, and we know the places that they've used guns, and to focus our resources on those people uh, in those places. It is not a quick fix. But over time, it will work. Um, and we're making those investments uh, to, to make that happen. I take your note on the criminal justice, uh, on the, the criminal code reform issues, and we are watching that closely. I know Deputy Mayor Gelthardt is watching that closely, uh, and we will be certain to weigh in on that. Uh, as um, the council is working on that, it is important that we all um, pay close attention and to make uh, the community's voices heard uh, in that process. Finally, uh, let me just talk about homelessness. And I've said that this pandemic has upended our lives in in some ways, we talked about a public safety ecosystem, um, but our homeless services system has also been impacted by uh, the pandemic in some very good ways. Um, we've learned some things about how our system can work in an emergency um, that is better um, for our residents experiencing homelessness. And we'll look to how we can further invest in those things. But it has also um, made our system, we had to de Densify uh, some of our shelters, um, and some people uh, decided to live in tents rather than to live in the shelters uh, because of the, the COVID protocols that we put in place. So getting people back into the shelter beds that we have is incredibly important. The pilot that Deputy Mayor Turnage and his team worked on um, to make sure residents who were living in homeless encampments could be living in housing rather than in in rat infested tents uh, has shown some early success. Uh, and we implemented those pilots uh, first in Ward 6, uh, which was experiencing uh, quite a problem uh, with encampments. And I'm very proud that most of the residents that we interacted with chose housing over the street. And that's why it's so important that we continue to stay the course uh, and make those necessary investments because we are a city where shelter is a right. There is a right to shelter in Washington, D.C. Uh, Wayne delivered his remarks from in front of a beautiful center in Ward 8, 801 Men's East Shelter. Um, and it is going to transform our men's homeless system the way we have transformed our family homeless system and it's not easy but we have um we we have the game plan it worked it worked when we closed dc general and created smaller dignified more service and rich short-term family housing it's allowed us to drive down family homelessness by 73 percent I think 801 Men's uh, is also uh, the example that we need to transform our men's system. And we're going to keep doing that work. Thank you, Mayor. We're going to go to our next in-studio question. Julia? Our next COVID hero does more than just sorting fruit snacks. This COVID hero actually is prepping our next budget director by teaching our littlest learners how to count. Nancy? Hello, my name is Nancy. I work in Jubilee Jumpstart as a teacher and I work with low income families and I have a question about housing. I would like to know how you are planning to expand affordable housing programs as we see an increase in renting prices and less opportunities for renting are available. Well, thank you for that question and thank you for all you're doing um, with our little folks. Uh, and the, the question of investing in affordable housing has, is really the hallmark of the work that I've done uh, as mayor. When I became mayor, we have a very important tool, an effective tool called the Housing Production Trust Fund. Uh, but we are only spending that previous year, I think, $50 million in the Housing Production Trust Fund because it, um, it went up and down with our, the taxes that we collected. So I said no matter what, we would spend $100 million a year, and we did that for six straight years. And then last year, uh, we were able to invest $400 million in the Housing Production Trust Fund. So that's a billion dollars um, that we'll get on the street to create new units, uh, over 20,000 units so far. Uh, in Washington, D.C. 
And so what that means is that families uh, who were looking in certain neighborhoods and couldn't find a place are now finding more units that will be available to them and more units that are below the market rate, so more units that are affordable to them. We've also been very focused on more people in Washington, D.C. being able to buy their home. Uh, we know that so many Washingtonians create wealth and pass on wealth that they can pass on to their kids by owning a home. So first-time home buyer programs are also critically important to us. It's also important that we preserve the affordable housing that we have uh, and a focus on seniors being able to stay in their own homes and keep their homes safe so that they can age in place in Washington, D.C. is also important to, be, to being able to have an affordable Washington. What we know and what we learned, um, we knew before the pandemic and we, we saw because of the pandemic, just how fragile um, this system is and just how on the line a lot of people are living. So an emergency, certainly a two-year emergency, made it impossible for people to pay their rent. And that's why getting out, better than most places across the country, the emergency rental assistance through Stay DC uh, was so critically important. More than $352 million distributed uh, in Stay DC. Uh, so that's why we, we're thinking about how emergency funds for when our D.C. residents experience emergencies uh, is so critical uh, to alleviating some of the fear around uh, just, you know, a month to month or an emergency that affects your home and your situation. But there's more, and I'm going to turn to you, Jenny, because I know how deeply you work with our public housing dollars and investments uh, to make sure that we have those units available to us as well. Great. Thank you, Mayor. And so as the Mayor mentioned, uh, uh, we have made such a significant commitment to affordable housing. And so through the investments in the DC Housing Authority that runs our public housing programs, we've invested more than $113 million to bring more of those units into a state of good repair um, so that those living conditions are healthy and safe. And we look forward to expanding that across more of the portfolio. We also invest significantly in programs called the Local Rent Supplement Program or Permanent supportive housing program. These are what are known as housing vouchers, um, and they provide permanent long-term affordable housing for families and individuals across the city. And in this fiscal year, in the current budget, there was a historic investment made in those housing vouchers. Over 3,400 vouchers are going to be available to individuals, to families, uh, those that need what's called permanent supportive housing and need additional services uh, for our homeless residents, those that are targeted affordable housing for families that just quite don't have uh, a high enough income to be able to afford the market rate. So as the mayor mentioned, we have a number of tools in our toolbox. Uh, we're pushing down on the accelerator on all of them, and I imagine the mayor will want us to do even more in the next fiscal year. Yes, but it's important to stay the course. You'll hear me say that sometimes. Um, we did $400 million last year, and it wasn't enough. Um, so as we go through this budget process, if you care about having affordable rents, then you're going to want to uh, have more invested in the Housing Production Trust Fund. So that's one part of the, the issue, building more housing. Uh, the, the other part of the, the issue, of course, is making sure that people's incomes are increasing and people are on the pathway uh, to good paying jobs. That's why we have been uh, very focused and uh, we were super supportive of the fight for 15 and getting that approved uh, by the Council of the District of Columbia. So now that the minimum wage over several years is $15, actually it's more um, now um, this year than $15 in the District of Columbia. Uh, we have fought very hard to make sure we have good paying jobs in DC government and we're hiring more DC residents uh, in those jobs. Uh, and that's that's been key because our, our employees have been key to us getting through this pandemic, uh, and we are just grateful that we've been able to keep our entire team with us uh, and make sure that they are they're getting the compensation 
um, that they deserve. Uh, you heard Paul, and I'm going to ask you, Paul, to talk a little bit more about our workforce investments, uh, because frequently, through, through especially the last two years, we've talked about the Department of Employment Services and the over $2 billion that they have issued in unemployment compensation. But now their job is uh, to look at the great resignation uh, and to look at all the people who are thinking about different jobs, thinking about retraining for jobs, uh, and making sure they're choosing uh, to work here in Washington, D.C. in the area of workforce during recovery. We focused in two broad areas once the pandemic hit. The first was what we called our response. And this is where we looked at all of the people who had come out of their jobs in the early part of the pandemic. And we worked hard to connect them with opportunities. These were hiring fairs. These were direct connections with employers that we were in touch with and so on. The second thing that we focused on was our recovery work. And we've taken full advantage of the federal and local dollars available to us to drive what we call high impact credentialing. And this is where we have engaged in a number of activities, including a tremendous investment in free associates and bachelor's degrees in high impact careers for all DC residents. We're also looking to the future. We've invested extensively, as you heard a little bit about before, in helping residents do learning at work. We know that that is, in some cases, the most valuable learning that's possible. So we've invested in pre-apprenticeships and apprenticeships, uh, along with on-the-job training and other partnerships with employers. And lastly, we are not just doing this by ourselves. We're transitioning much of our workforce system to being employer-led and employer-driven. We're giving grants out to employers who are helping us design the kinds of training that they need to ensure that workers are ready for the jobs that we're going to have tomorrow and the next day, and not just the jobs that we have today. So we're doing a lot of work in that area, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Mayor. We're going to go to Camille in Ward 8 for our next question. Camille, you are able to ask your question now. Hi, can you hear me okay? Just making sure. Okay, well, hi everyone. My name is Camille Range. I am a Ward 8 resident. Uh, by day, I am a registered dietitian for Martha's Table. And by night, I am a doctoral student at the University of the District of Columbia. I'm really glad that we've been talking and having conversation as it relates to food access. But as you can imagine, my job as a dietitian is really in the education and the behavior change that needs to happen once you have the access to those fruits and vegetables. So my questions are really regarding the nutrition education and engagement in DC, and ultimately your budget priorities as it relates to two different places, one being our schools and how we're going to maximize the budget of our DCPS FNS department to really promote um, nutrition education and health education in our schools. We have great examples like food prints that have really shown great successes, but ultimately are only reaching about 20 schools. And we know that we have over a hundred here as particularly only in DCPS. The other um, pipeline I'm ultimately asking about, I'm glad that Deputy Mayor Kin ultimately touched a little bit on, but how we're fueling the pipeline for the future of nutrition, food, and health educators, because again, our community is going to need the support and ultimately embodying and living that healthy lifestyle. And so I want to really make sure I was advocating and asking those questions for how you plan to do that with your FY23 budget. Well, thank you for that. And we're still developing the FY23 budget, but we have made uh, certainly educating uh, our children about food and nutrition and having uh, healthy access to foods um, a, a top priority. So we're going to continue to do that. Um, and like I said at the, the top, our investment in public education is 10% um, more than it was last year. So we're going from a $2 billion budget to a $2.2 .2 billion budget. Uh, and we can expect um, that investment in the, the kids' nutrition nutrition and wellness to be a top priority. Paul, I don't know if you have anything more to say about the pipeline for educators that are focused on food and wellness. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much, Mayor. Thank you for the very, very important question. As the mayor said, this is a topic we're deeply 
concerned about and deeply engaged in. We've asked the chancellor and leaders across the public charter school sector to help us think about how we can ensure our young people are learning all kinds of important life skills, including health, uh, nutrition, uh, financial skills, and so on, as we understand the importance of those things. On the pipeline for educators, we are investing quite extensively in helping to ensure that we continue to develop the educators that we need for the roles that we have available. And that includes a big investment in a Grow Your Own program, which asks and invites both DC high school students who are residents, but also paraprofessionals who are currently working to join us in a path to becoming the educators that we need for the jobs that we know we have. And that's in addition, as I mentioned, to the scholarships that we have available for associates and bachelor's degrees. So we are um, working hard to ensure that we will have the educators that we've required for the kinds of activities you're describing. All right, we're going to go to our next question. Uh, and apologies if I mispronounce this, but Rania in Ward 2, you are able to ask your question now. Hi, my name is Jamia, and I'm actually in Ward 1. I work for the Central American Resource Center, where we provide resources to uh, legal, uh, provide legal resources to immigrants in the community. And I'm here because I wanted to raise my voice and ask for $5 million uh, for funding for the immigrant community, specifically the IJLS program. And also I wanted to inquire what are the investments that the DC government is seeking to make for immigrant rights in the city? Well, thanks for that question. Um, we created uh, the Immigrant Justice and Legal Grants, I guess, hmm, first year the Trump administration, let me just put it that way. And uh, we we saw very clearly the attacks on, on DC residents and we stood shoulder to shoulder uh, with each other uh, to make sure that our immigrant communities could fight not only the hateful rhetoric, but the real attacks on, on their safety. Um, so I'm very proud of that work. Um, we have partnered with very effective organizations and even expanded it. Um, someone will remind me, uh, Jenny, of all of the, the services now that are included in, the, in those grants. Yes, Mayor. So there are about $3.5 million invested in those services in our FY22 budget, and they include uh, legal support. Um, they include um, any kind of like navigation, housing, uh, immigration challenges. So a whole suite of services uh, for folks as to well access. As well as citizenship support. As well as citizenship so support. So people who mm -hmm. are applying. Um, and what we learned is a lot of people who were eligible for citizenship in the application, the process, weren't applying because um, the fees were a barrier. And I think it's like $700. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, making those grants available allowed a lot of Washingtonians to become American citizens over the last several years. So we have grown. I think our first um, investment was a million dollars, and now we're a $3.5 million program, and we will um, continue uh, to stay focused on those investments. Um, and our uh, constituency offices continue um, to, to work with all of our immigrant communities on um, the issues of great importance. Uh, housing um, tends to, to be a top priority uh, in uh, the investments that we're making in housing also um, are, are very helpful to our immigrant communities uh, all, all across the district. And so um, I would say, I, would, I dare say, um, to stay focused on affordable housing, safe and affordable housing. Thank you, Mayor. We're gonna go to Heidi next for our qu next question, Heidi in Ward 6. Heidi, you are now able to ask your question. Thank you so much. Hello, Mayor Bowser and um, the rest of the esteemed uh, guest here. I, my name is Heidi Ellis. I work with the DC LGBTQ Budget Coalition. Um, and I'm just here to say, um, one, we were successfully able to advocate for um, around four point uh, four plus million dollars for our, our community in, the, in FY22. And we're looking to expand on that and continue funding around key services um, for low barrier shelters, intimate partner violence counseling and housing services um, to continue to work with OHR to reduce the case backlog. Um, of issues there, and then also um, working to expand our and have a more long-term strategy around our transgender non-conforming workforce program. Um, what we're hoping to see in the FY23 budget is that continued funding and support around that, but also more commitment to additional housing vouchers, 
um, for our community. We had 46 in the cycle this last time. We're looking to increase that number and have some of those vouchers tied to supportive service dollars. Um, as some folks in our community are, are suffering from substance abuse um, and, and other issues. And lastly, I would say that we're hoping to increase the grant making ability of the Mayor's Office of LGBT Care Affairs to actually um, it, it empower our community and our community based organizations to do some of this work on the ground as they are the experts. Um, and they uh, they have the cultural competency to do this work because uh, so many of these services are housed in the agencies and there's sometimes delay and um, and they're not always able to respond in real time. And we're hoping to increase the LGBTQ Affairs Office ability to address some of those issues and re remove some of those barriers for our community. Okay, well, thank you for your very specific ask. Um, and we did quite a lot of work together in the last budget cycle uh, to to put investments, um, as, as you know, that may have been across the government and various agencies uh, and to concentrate them in, in some, um, some regards. So I appreciate that feedback uh, and we will we'll take that uh, into our continued discussions. All right, Mayor, we're gonna go to our next question in Ward 7. Trina in Ward 7, you are now able to ask your question. That, uh, into our continued discussions. All right, Mayor, we're going to go to our next question in Ward 7. Trina in Ward 7, you are now able to ask your question. Can, can you guys hear me? Um, I can't hear you guys. However, um, I'm Trina Robinson. I'm a bona fide Washingtonian. Been here all my life, 48 years. The question I had for the mayor, um, when speaking about the FY23 budget, is any money allocated to MORCA to in, expand their voucher program to meet the needs of single and family returning citizens and to expand the peer-to-peer -peer support um, and also help returning citizens when they face legal challenges or discriminations uh, as it surrounds the housing portion? Because I think that uh, MORCA does a good job with uh, with their last housing program. So I really think that housing program need to expand and they should have a little budget to kind of issue out micro loans and micro grants to small businesses that work directly with returning citizens. Trina, thank you for that, um, that question. And we have, and you heard the deputy mayor talk about some of our FY22 um, public safety investments, and they do uh, include uh, investments in helping um, our residents who are coming home from incarceration uh, better come home. Uh, and we want them to, to come home and have a shot um, at getting back with their families and getting back um, to employment um, and, and having a, a chance to restart. Uh, and so much of that involves housing. And so this year we were able to pilot, pilot a program um, to provide um, housing vouchers uh, to some of our public safety involved residents. Um, and we know that that is going to be tremendously helpful. Um, and I don't know, Chris or Jenny, if you want to say a little bit more about some of the other investments in the mayor's office on returning citizens, also we call MORCA. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and yes, talking about the 22 budget, we were able to um, make an increased investment in the peer navigators as well, and they're coming on board right now. Um, our director at MORCA was able to uh, Lamont Carey was able to start that hiring process. He has the first couple on, and there are more coming on right now. So that peer navigation process is moving forward. Um, they're also working very closely um, with some of our other agencies in looking at how we're going to be doing the vouchers um, for housing for that. So that's an, in a, a process that we're ongoing right now to make sure that we're meeting the need um, in that area. So a couple of investments, Jenny, I don't know if you want to talk about any more, but those are a couple ones I know we're working right now and looking forward to continuing as we go forward. Absolutely, and thank you, Deputy Mayor. I would just add, too, through our Office of Victim Services and Justice Grants Administration, we give out a number of grants to organizations that work with returning citizens. And this year, in Mayor Bowser's FY22 budget, we invested $10 million a year for three years to provide cash assistance to returning citizens to help them get back on their feet. That program is just launching now, and we are really excited to provide that funding to those organizations that work directly with returning 
citizens to provide them the flexible funds for whatever they need uh, in order to get back on their feet. All right, Mayor, we've come to that time where we have one last question. Okay. Uh, I do want to remind everyone you can go to budget.dc.gov after the forum ends to continue to share your budget priorities with the mayor. Uh, we also have a voicemail line set up where you can share your uh, a phone call voicemail uh, of your budget priorities. We'll make sure that the mayor and the budget team get that. Uh, but we're going to go to Salvador in Ward 5 for our last question of the evening. Salvador, your line is unmuted and you're able to ask us your question. Buenas noches, Mayor. Uh, my name is Salvador Salcedo Guzman. I'm a commissioner here in Ward 5. Uh, thank you to you and your team for putting this forum together. Um, our neighborhoods are becoming more dense due to new developments and gentrification. And with that, we're seeing more trash on the streets, especially with more and more people being home during the pandemic. DPW can't properly manage demand for 311 requests to clean and manage the trash. How can we allocate better wages to the men and women that clean our streets and better resource and solutions to making our streets better? My district is actually across the street from DPW, and some of our blocks look at times abandoned by the agencies that should be helping with this, with this problem. Our neighbors feel that with cleaner streets come more respect to the block, and with that, we can probably solve a little bit more of the problems that we're facing. Well, it sounds like I need to walk around those blocks with you um, to figure out what's going on. We place a very high priority on keeping uh, DC streets clean uh, and the men and women of DPW um, take their work and their jobs very seriously. In fact, um, they're the team um, that throughout this entire pandemic uh, have been in person at work every single day uh, and uh, making sure that our trash and recycling have, have been picked up. We have and continue to be focused on our litter cans. Uh, you know those brown cans that you see on commercial corridors that are for, you know, incidental trash. Um, people walking by, people at the bus stop dropping a trash can. What they're not for is people's residential trash, uh, and we continue have to have a problem with that, but we know we're going to work with our ANC commissioners on the public education um, that's involved um, with that. Uh, in terms of, and this will give me an opportunity to ask uh, the city administrator to talk about our work with all of our employees um, to make sure that they have been safe throughout this pandemic, that we've had the best COVID protocols, uh, including testing and access to vaccination, uh, and of course, fair compensation. Uh, we know that um, uh, we value our workers greatly and through the pandemic, our highest priority has been on their safety. So we provided them with PPE. Uh, we provided them with support they need if they get sick with COVID so they don't have to go into their personal sick leave or annual leave. So we can uh, make sure we're just doing things that are fair and re reflect the important work that they do. Uh, we also recognize, uh, and uh, as a city, we uh, negotiate uh, with their labor unions, uh, wage increases. Uh, we have active negotiations with nearly every labor union we have in the city to make sure that we're doing right for our workers and recognizing their increasing cost of living and the valuable support and work that they do. Uh, so um, thank you for highlighting uh, what they do. DPW in particular has as been strained as any agency in the city uh, between their core work and you're right, the effects of the pandemic uh, sometimes show up in areas you don't expect, uh, such as people being home, our litter cans getting more full, uh, and the 3 one requests that are placed upon that workforce are greater. So even earlier today, we had a discussion with the mayor, uh, with the deputy mayor Babers as well, about how do we right size the workforce so we make sure they have enough resources that they need to reflect the kind of demands that we see for clean streets and clean communities that uh, that are part of our new normal now. Uh, so thank you for that advocacy. And let's get that. Um, Babers and I will be out to, to see you. Thank you so much, Mayor. Well, Mayor, you just heard from some of our DC residents about their budget priorities. And now has come the time of the results of the district-wide $100 game. And okay. I'm going to ask our deputy mayors to give us a little bit of a drum roll. I don't think they got a, a drum roll keyed up for me yet. So as we wait for the results, what's it going to be? I think it's popping up. I don't have it on my screen here yet. There we go. Uh, so really great job to all our, our deputy mayors for their pitches. Education, bringing it home, number one with $21 allocated followed by a tie of health and human services and housing and economic development at $20 each a piece, uh, $17 for public safety and justice, $12 for transportation and the environment, and $10 for government operations. That's higher. 
that's an increase. Good job, Lindsay. Um, economic development. Is <laughs> so, too. Mayor, I would like to turn it to you is for. That, your... Does that add up to a hundred dollars? It does. <laughs> okay. That's what wow. my team is telling me. <laughs> okay. But, Mayor, I want to turn it to you uh, on your on your reflecting thoughts on the evening. Well, um, those numbers, and we'll we'll you'll report out to Moss from your office. I know how it's changed over the years, but I will say I think it's equaled out across the clusters a little bit. Uh, and today, I really want to thank my team. I want to thank Tomas Talamante and his entire team. Give them a round of applause uh, for putting um, together. Uh, people who have participated with us before know that we're usually in a school gym. Uh, in these last two years, we've been um, more virtual and we have done our very best uh, to keep it as interactive as possible. I also want to recognize uh, Jenny Reed and her team, our budget director. Please give her a round of applause um, for the year long work um, and the very detailed work that they do to prepare our budget. And this is, it's not perfunctory what we're doing. Um, what we're doing is listening uh, to, to what's important to you, your eyes and ears. Um, and so I want to make sure there's nothing that we're missing uh, as we produce this very, very important document uh, to send to the council. It does indeed reflect our values, uh, and it does indeed reflect where we are in the city and where we need to go. Um, next year and the several years after that. So what we're doing uh, is extremely important. I also want to thank the city administrator and the deputy mayors who you have heard from. Um, they represent over 70 cabinet members uh, who run our agencies. They're professionals. They're experts at what they do. Uh, and they're supported by outstanding uh, DC government workers as well. Uh, and they take this process extremely seriously too. So we will prepare propose this budget, the council will pr approve a balanced budget, and then we will make sure that we execute it to the best of our ability uh, to deliver on the promises that we have made. Uh, so certainly, uh, this has been an unusual time uh, responding uh, to COVID, a racial reckoning uh, that swept our country, an uh, economic crisis um, that hit us hard, but because of our resilience um, and because of the careful way that we manage uh, the city's finances, we can make huge, historic, transformative uh, investments in our future. So thank you very much for sticking with us. Uh, thank you for trusting us um, with your, your families, uh, with your dreams, with your kids at school, uh, and with what you want to see for yourself, uh, your neighborhood, and our city. Uh, we won't let you down. Thank you so much, Mayor. And again, I want to thank everybody at home for joining us across the city, uh, inviting us into your living rooms, your kitchens, to share your budget priorities with Mayor, Mayor Bowser. And we want to remind you, you can continue to share your budget priorities at budget.dc.gov. Thank you, and have a great evening, Washington, D.C.